hope you're all doing well tonight. As we begin, if you all have your Bibles, what? Are you reading? All right. Did you type all of it? I just got in there. Did you type? Good evening. Hope you're we'll, we'll go to Q&A after the lesson. How about that? I'll defer, I'll defer my answer to that, uh, to the Q&A section after, afterwards. Um, we'll, be, we'll be in Psalm chapter 22, or I shouldn't say Psalm chapter 22, Psalm 22, the 22nd Psalm. And uh, as you're turning there, I want to open up, what's that? 22, Psalm 22. No, no, not 122. This is, okay. This is, this is the 22nd Psalm, Psalm of David. And this is a Psalm of uh, anguish and loneliness. And so I was going to do, I was wondering where it go with this. And I went a couple different passages and then I went, you know what? I don't think. I should go anywhere else doing a lesson on loneliness in the Christian life than the psalm. Because the thing about the psalms is the psalms are, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, they are mostly poetic expressions of feelings. So uh, they're not always, you know, meant to be taken literally and stuff. We're going to see quite a bit of that actually in the 22nd psalm. Um but uh, you can definitely tell when reading this, this is a, this is a man who is absolutely, uh, whatever's happening to him, he is in some, some anguish and some depression and loneliness. So I want to open up the floor with this question, which is, I want you to, as I'm reading this psalm, I'm going to read the whole psalm. I'm not going to get to every verse in the psalm. I'm not going to execute the whole thing. But I will read the entire psalm. I think that's going to kind of provide the baseline for the lesson and here's the question here's what a this is what a the thought experiment rather i want you to do i want you to think to the loneliness loneliest i should say loneliest part of your life up until now the loneliest part of your life up until now i already had mine in my head before this one it was quite pathetic uh <laughs> to say the least but yes it was it's very lonely, and uh, I also want to give a definition of the word loneliness, just so we're clear with this. I looked it up in Webster's Dictionary. It says, it's a sadness because one has no friends or company. So it's a feeling of being alone, like there's nobody there to comfort you. The word itself, lonely, if you kind of deconstruct it, it comes from the word alone, as if nobody's actually there. Now, for the Christian, one who is truly saved... Loneliness really is not actually a thing that can happen. The actual thing, loneliness itself, it, it's always a lie, I should say. A Christian is never actually alone. And I want you to know, uh, before we read our 22nd Psalm, I thought of another verse um, over in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it real quickly. It says, Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God, through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. We have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weakness, Hebrews 4.15. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. So that means, back in Hebrews chapter 7, that right now, if, if you are saved, if you are in Christ, if Christ has died for you, Christ is standing before the Father, or seating before the Father, I should say, and he is interceding for you, which is just another way of saying he's praying for you. And he's always there. Now, I love with that first section uh, I'm reading from the NASB. The ESB says he is able to save to the uttermost. That's just kind of a, a way of saying that his salvation, his atonement, is a perfect atonement. It, it completely saves you. So, without further ado, let's get into the psalm. Okay, ready? Psalm 22. For the choir director upon Ajaleth Hashashar, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy. O oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. 
In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me, and they separate with the lip. They wag their heads, saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Yet you are he who brought me forth from thy womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a poster, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen, you answer me. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him even he who cannot keep his soul alive. Posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has performed it. This has been the reading of the word of God. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, I don't know the circumstances of those in this room here. I don't know if some have come here feeling dreads of loneliness or wonders of joy or somewhere in between, I don't know. But I just want to pray for those who may not be in the best position, maybe hurting, maybe crying to you and feel like they haven't gotten a clear answer. You are the one true God who is able to sympathize with us, the one true God who is praying for us, who truly cares about us and loves us. And I praise you and give you thanks for that, Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. But throughout the psalm, it is not difficult to see that the psalmist is going through anguish. And the psalmist is identified as David, but like any true pastor, I will refer to him as the psalmist. He's going through quite a bit of anguish, and he starts out by asking a very interesting question. He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, it's very important to note that the Psalms are full of poetic language and expressions of feelings that are not necessarily meant to be taken literally um, or woodenly, whatever you want to call that. I think the first part of this Psalm is a good example of that because the Psalm is expressing how he feels. It is as though God has left him. His enemies have surrounded him. They're mocking him in all these ways, and it feels as though he's been left alone. He's expressing himself in a passionate way, but I don't think the point to take away is that God has literally totally abandoned him and he's not there anymore. That would be contradicting the character of God, and it would also be contradicting the psalmist because the psalmist uh, in Psalm 139, verse 8, says, this is a very popular verse, If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. 
if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Which again, we're talking about uh, how Psalms are poetic. That's a poetic way of saying you're always there. Doesn't matter where I am. I could be in heaven. I could be in hell. You are literally always there. In fact, to just to put it in a bit of a more graphic way, we could reject the forgiveness of God and die in our sin and go to hell. And in a sense, we would still not completely escape the presence of God. Hell is a place for the ungodly where God's wrath is poured out. And so that, even though that's obviously his unpleasant presence, we still wouldn't escape his presence even if we go down to the abyss. Um, I heard somebody once say that even when we intentionally run away from the uh, presence of God, since God is omnipresent, which means that he's everywhere all at once, we actually just end up running right towards him. And I'm always reminded of the prophet Jonah, who was called to go to Nineveh, but he fled to Tarshish, which if you know your navigation is in the complete opposite direction. And then the Lord sent a big fish to swallow him up and brought back Jonah where he was called to. Jonah could not flee as we cannot flee God. But, brothers and sisters, I hope that we don't be like Jonah and flee from the Almighty God. Fleeing from God is the most foolish thing that we can do as Christians. In one of the most compassionate calls from our Lord, he says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely, lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And uh, I just don't see any reason why anybody would want to run away from that other than the fact that they are blinded by their own sin. It makes sense that a sinner would run away from God because they're living in darkness and they're repelled by the light but a christian that doesn't make any sense why would a, it is so foolish for a christian to be running away from the presence of god when the call to the christian is so tender and compassionate and lovely it's foolish for a christian to be lonely um but we've all been there we may even be there in this room right now and if you're there, you, the psalmist here certainly understands you. He cries out in verse 2. He says, why are you so far from saving me? He says, to you I cry day by day, and you do not answer me, and by night, but I find no, rant, uh, no rest. Which again is just a poetic way of saying, I'm always crying to you by day and by night. He's always crying to you. But you don't answer now, when I, when I heard that, I cried to you all day and I don't get an answer, I was reminded by something that Pastor Steve Canfield said, which is, um, he said, the Lord always answers in one of three ways. Yes, no, and wait. And I think he actually adds in a fourth one and says, you've got to be kidding me. But uh, seriously, yes, no, and wait. And so it's clear to me that the Lord... When he gives the third answer, when he gives a wait, that's not a non-answer, that's a wait. And we're just so impatient that we can't understand that, and we think that the Lord is not answering us. And so it's clear to me that the Lord uh, did answer the psalmist's prayer, but he answered it with the third one. He said, wait, I'm not, it's not my time to work yet. You're going to have to wait on me. You're going to have to be patient. Can I say something about that? Yeah, sure, go ahead. I think it's a possibility that it, well... Not in the case of David specifically, but I feel like sometimes we hear a no from God, and it's not what we want to hear, so it's, oh, God, did, God didn't answer our, our prayer. Yep. We almost overlook it. Yep, and that comes from a, um, a, a, a distrusting heart. You Something happens in your life, and it's not what you want, and you immediately think that the Lord is acting against you, when oftentimes the exact opposite is true. These things appear to us to be the wrong thing, appears to us to be a disaster, but the Lord is working something good out of it. So yeah, that's a very great point there, Colin. We're so impatient. We're so um, impatient as people, but then in verse 3, it takes a much different turn. Uh, turn. It, it, it goes from gloomy and woe is me 
to where our attitudes should be in those times where our hearts are uh, depressed and lonely, which is, of course, praise. He says in verse 3, Yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, and they delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. There's a lot of things that I love about this. The first one is you always get this charge that Christians are running off of blind faith. But even in the Bible, when the psalmist, what the psalmist is doing here is he's basically deferring to evidence. He's saying, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're the God who helped them. We have the writings. We have uh, all this stuff. And it's in you that I trust you. You're the God who led Moses and the Israelites out of slavery. Um, another thing I love about this is that uh, because these are very, very feeling, very, very heavy based off of the feelings, is that you can't really accuse the psalmist of being fake or lying, right? These are they're, they're being they're being authentic. They're, they're expressing themselves in a way. And uh, what I mean to say is, here's a man who describes himself as a worm in verse six. In a verse 8, he is mocked and he is laughed at. He's got nowhere to go, so in his deepest moments of loneliness and despair, he turns to worship. If you skip down to verse 23, look what he says. He says, You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from them. But when he cried for help, he heard. And uh, there's a reason why I ask you all to think about that loneliest moment in your life, because here in verse 23, it really gives uh, a uh, blunt, um, and it's certainly not a, uh, this is exactly what somebody would want to hear in this moment. Where where were you, Lord? What were you doing? I felt so alone. I felt like I was abandoned. And yet here's the psalmist saying, he heard your cry for help. He heard. Nor has he hidden his face from him. He is not despised. He despised. He afflicted. Have you ever cried to the Lord? Have you ever had physical tears rolling down your face? Maybe when you're alone in your bed at night? Well, what the psalmist is saying here is that he hurt you. Don't think for a second that when you were crying, the only thing that hurt you was the wall. He was there. He heard you. He was not far off. He was near. My favorite, what's got to be my favorite story in the entire Bible, is found in Isaiah chapter 38. Uh, you don't have to turn it I'll read it real quick. It's the story of Hezekiah. And King Hezekiah, who is... I, I love Hezekiah, and Hezekiah became sick, and the prophet Isaiah uh, came to him and said, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. That's all in verse 1. And then this is what it says in verse 2. This is, sometimes I'm shocked that this is even in the Bible. It says, Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before you in truth with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. Yes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Now, I'm going to stop right there for just a second, for verse 4. Let me just explain. So he's morsely ill. Probably means that he's laying in his bed, right? Probably. Not for sure, but he's probably laying in his bed. He's probably in a lot of pain. And then... The man who speaks on behalf of God comes to him. He's not doing very good. And he says, yeah, you're going to die. Yep, okay, bye. And then he leaves. And Hezekiah's response to this, less than pleasant news, is to turn his face towards the wall and just sob like a baby. And, and, and obviously this, this wept bitterly is not a reference to a tear or two that's what it means when you're just you're getting cramps in your leg because you're crying so much you're losing so much fluids and he doesn't know what to do so he just cries to the lord lord i beseech you please save me and 
This is what it says in verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, verse 5, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord. And the Lord here, if you're uh, not reading the word, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It's Isaiah chapter 38, verse 5. And I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with what that means. That means the ancient of days. That is the most holy name ever given to the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the God of your father, David, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. And he doesn't stop there. He says in verse 6, I will deliver you and the city from the hand of the king of the Assyrians, and I will defend the city. Hezekiah was told that he would die, and clearly he did not take the news lightly. He turned his face to the wall. Um, he wept bitterly. He was hopeless, so he cried to the Lord. And then verse 5 says, Yahweh, the Ancient of Days, issues a proclamation. I love this. This isn't the governor. Okay, This isn't Bell Edwards. This isn't Joe Biden. This isn't the king of the world. This is the creator of the entire universe. He speaks. And the holy commander of the angel army says to this dying, probably very old, sinful man, I have heard your cries. I have seen your tears. You will not die. And he even says that he'll deliver him from the most furious enemies of the Israelites, which were, of course, the Assyrians. And our Lord is just so gracious and abounding in steadfast love. And something I, I love so much about this psalm is that the majority of the psalm here, you get like in verse 3 and then in verse uh, 25, you get these little hints of, of pray, you get these praises to the Lord, but the majority of the psalm is like anguish and despair. And he's, and he's expressing how lonely it is. But the end of the psalm takes a very interesting turn because then it ends in such an optimistic way. He says, beginning in verse 26, he says, All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And the families of the nations will worship before you. 28, for the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. And all the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. And those who go down to the dust will bow before him. Even he who cannot keep his soul alive. Posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord that the coming generation, they will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed it. We are promised before the Lord uh, that all of the nations will worship him. And I think that this hope that uh, the Lord will rule over all the nations, that we can move forward in those lonely times with optimism and with excitement, that we can trust the Lord, the words of the living and the true God, and they can be a comfort to us. Now, I want to go back to Jesus here. You notice I have... This is... Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So verse 3 and uh, 25 through the end. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's like he takes a break from um, his anguish to realize or uh, to state God's omnipotence. Yes. And... Like no, no matter how small or lonely I feel, mm -hmm. you are God, and I'm looking for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why I think in verse three it was he he references to himself as a worm. And what's interesting is like they probably didn't have any reference to single celled amoeba at the time. Probably the the smallest, most insignificant, like disgusting creature at the time probably was a worm. Like that's what I that's what I probably think that that verse is referring to. Like. Compared to, oh, hey baby, uh, compared to the Lord, here's the, here's the smallest, most insignificant creature I can compare myself in reference to the Lord. Like, probably the dirt would be the next step after that, right? The dirt isn't actually alive. So this living worm, that's all that I am. And, and you are so ancient of days, and I'm not even worthy to give you worship. Like, like I think that's what kind of, point is saying there so yeah good reference so uh i haven't mentioned jesus yet 
and Jesus, and I want to go to Jesus here, because this is, the sermon obviously is about loneliness in the Christian life. Jesus, we're often given, I think, a false, I think, a, a, I should say, a misguided view of Jesus, because Sometimes our view of Jesus is warped to have a little too much emphasis on that divine nature. I read at the beginning in Hebrews 4.15 that he is not able to, um, or, or he is rather able to sympathize with the weakness. Um, so he's not just divine, he was a human being. Um, and then me and Alexa actually just watched uh, Jesus Revolution the other day. And I think in that movie, it put way, way, way too much emphasis on that sort of meek and mild human, oh, please, you know, use your free will to come to me. I promise it, it'll be, a, just give me a try, hit me, Jesus, you know? And obviously, it, it's important to have a balance, right? Because this is, was, in the early church, this was massive, right? It was our Christology. And then people like Athanasius were strongly defending. He was fully God and he was fully man. So what does it mean to be fully man? Well, I thought of a couple verses that show that Jesus, just like every other human being, he, he wasn't a man that doesn't know what it's like to be abandoned or lonely or um, sorrowful. Uh, he was abandoned when um, in the, the passion by everyone. Everyone fled. Even his closest friends at the beginning, they ended up following him later, but at the beginning, they all left. They all abandoned him. He was left and Jesus probably felt lonelier than any other human being has ever felt ever. Um, I thought of uh, Matthew, for example, Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. It says, uh, now from the sixth hour of darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. And then in verse 46 it says, now about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if you remember what we opened up Psalm chapter 22 with, those are the same words. So there's a big misconception that Jesus' words here, again, just like the psalmist, are meant to be taken literally, and that in this moment on the cross, Jesus was literally totally forsaken by God and their relationship was totally cut off. I do not think that that is what Jesus is referencing here. I think Jesus is... Uh, referencing Psalm chapter 22 and he's expressing himself in a totally uh, uh, that he is just going through this absolutely excruciating anguish and he's ref you know referencing Psalm chapter 22 which is what the psalmist was doing and so um, I want to if we can recap the passion of Jesus it began obviously in the garden he tells his disciples Okay, stay awake, go over here, I'm going to go pray. He goes and prays for, I think, an hour. Comes back and goes sleeping. I'm like, Jesus, thanks guys, you can't even stay awake. And then the guards come and they arrest him, and his disciples flee, and then they send him for Pilate, and Pilate, you know, dips his hands in the water, I find no fault in him, do whatever. He has him scored, crown of thorns, and ultimately crucified. And so he's going through all this horrible physical pain. I don't even want to begin to know what it feels like to be scourged and crucified. Um, again, me and, me and Alexa were actually watching Gladiator the other day. And that had some that had some brutal stuff in it. I don't even I'm glad we live in 2023 to be honest with you. Um, but with all of this intense physical and emotional pain something did happen upon that cross that was so much worse than any other physical pain that Jesus could have felt. Jesus was God incarnate, so he was just as much God as Yahweh is. And something mysterious happened while Jesus was on the cross. He took on the wrath of God in place of the sinner. So for those, he died for people, and for those people, instead of them getting the wrath of God, he took it on for them. And Jesus took on uh, the wrath of God and became sin on our behalf. So, in a sense, that perfect union that Jesus had with the Father was corrupted in some sense. And all of his friends deserted him. So, he was truly alone. And yet, in all of this, that was something that Jesus did 
literally. I believe that it was something that the son decided to do with the father in eternities past uh, but the timeline. It, what's important is the matter that this is actually something that he agreed to do willingly. We all agree here that the son did not need to do that. The father is totally self-existing. That's what he says to Moses. I am that I am. I am self-existing. Which is another way of saying, I don't need you, really. <laughs> it's another way of saying, I exist as myself, and I don't need you to worship me. I can be perfectly content with myself, with, with the Trinity and us living together. And yet, he chose to create humanity and die for it. And he says in uh, John chapter 10, verse 15, he says, Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father... I lay down my life for the sheep. And in verse 18 it says, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. And so, the, the, the beginning part of verse 18, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. That's a way of saying, this is Jesus directly here is saying, I chose to do this. I lay it down on my own accord. This is not, they're going to capture me and it's going to look like this is all happening and I didn't want it to happen. Uh, of course, he did pray in the garden. If there's any other way, let's cut past for me. But this is something that he did on his own, by his own choice. And Jesus truly knew what it felt like to be lonely. If ever, if, if, if ever, <clears throat> if anyone ever had the right to be lonely, it was Jesus. Isaiah had this to say about the Messiah. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3. Listen to these words. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Now, that right there is the word of God. That's the word of the living and true God. And that's what it says about the word incarnate. That's what it has to say about God. He was despised. He was a man of sorrows. He felt sorrows on such a level that none of us would ever feel. So much so that he was given a, that he was given a title for it. And it, that's just astonishing to me. There's an old hymn uh, that opens with the lyrics like this. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. And so even in our worst moments, I hope that we be still and know that there is somebody who is with you, <clears throat> Who, who feels you, who knows what it feels like to be sorrowful, who is praying for you. If you are saved, he is right there praying for you right now. He died for you. Um, but he, did, he didn't do it all for you. He did it for his own glory. And that's exactly what we should do. Whether our hearts are completely full of joy in the moment, or if we're having some of the worst times of our, of our life, we should do what the psalmist does in Psalm chapter 22. And we should turn back sing hallelujah so that's pretty much all I got for tonight um, I promised a Q&A so if anybody has any questions now's the time I don't have a question but I'll say something real quick if you don't mind I'm not trying to take over no, no that, this is uh, I'm, out of, I'm out of words so it's freelancing here with the thing with tears there's one thing you have to be careful of is the Bible mm -hmm. talks about um, the tears of Edom mm-hmm and oh yeah, how, and how he, though he lifted up his voice, mm -hmm. he was not heard by God. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be careful that we're not just crying out and not really crying out to God like we want to and following Him, even though we can very well convince ourselves. There have been plenty of people who convince themselves that they're Christians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, making sure we're not crying out in selfishness. Yep. Uh, uh, D uh, Daniel Jeffretta once sent me a video of a sermon, and I really need to see if I can go find that sermon. I cannot remember for the life of me who the pastor was who gave the sermon, 
but I remember he spoke in such a way that really caught my attention. And the things that he was saying was like shocking. It was kind of like a kind of like a Stephen Lawson kind of John MacArthur kind of guy who was like, "This guy's going to preach the word. He don't care who hears it, right?" And at some point in the video, he says, "Do not think that just because you're crying over your sin that that is necessarily sins of repentance. It could be sins of uh, remorse." And then he says, "Anybody can whip up a batch of tears." And I remember thinking, "Wow, like what?" What kind of pastor would look at their congregation and go, yeah, who cares if you're crying? Anybody can look at your past tears. What really matters is, are you really repenting of your sin? He's, he, he said that specifically in reference to people who sin, and then they go and, and they you know, lament over their own sin. He's like, okay, that's fine. Just make sure that those are tears of repentance, not remorse. Judas had remorse. He, was sad. he, he said, I sinned. And what did he do? He, he went and hung himself. Remorse means sadness. That you are to be sad over the fact that you are sinning is not necessarily the same thing to be repentant. Okay? Repentance leads you to God. It leads you to a hatred of your own sin and a turn to worship God. Anybody can be sad over the consequences of their sin and, and the situation that it's gotten themselves in. But um, true repentance is meant to lead you to faith in God. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the idea that we're we're sorry that we got caught. Yeah. Yep. Not, yep. not that we're That's sorry about what we did, but we're sorry we got caught. Yep. But not necessarily. Remorse isn't just that. It can be right. for anything. You know, like if you have a, a, a pet or something that's sick and is dying, mm -hmm. you go ahead and kill it so that it doesn't suffer. Well, you you become you've grown a bond with that animal, mm -hmm. so now you feel remorse because you just killed it. Even though in the end, that, that's what uh, it was actually better to do that. But it's like, yeah, that's the sadness. Yep. But the way you talk about it, yeah, that's what you say. As far as uh, repentance, more say we got caught, not mm -hmm. that we actually did. Any other thoughts, concerns, conundrums, comments? Wait, say that last part again? That, like, then, like, you want to do this other thing that is sinful? Well, the desires to sin are probably never like, going to go away this side no, of heaven. Because, like, you're repentant of uh -huh. a certain sin. Yeah. But then at the same time, like, because you're upset that you did that, mm -hmm. then you're also, like, tempted to do this other sin. Yeah, I think I think I'm, I think you're, prone, you're already at weakness because of yep. what's happened. So you're yeah. prone to do something else. That's a great way. I was about to say that. That's a great way of putting my thoughts, Colin. I don't know how to say it. Yes, in those moments of uh, remorse and and if you're led to true repentance, you are in a vulnerable spot, and so there is a tendency to. Okay, what am I? I actually understand exactly what you're saying because I remember being in those positions of. Um, fall back into this sin and I repent of it now how do I go forward right do I do I uh, do I um, well I've sinned so I might as well keep sinning and then tomorrow that's that's when I really start back tomorrow well that, uh, that that's not really true repentance right yeah we never actually say it to ourselves but that's unconsciously kind of what we're thinking sometimes in the moment um, so, you know, I get what you're saying I'm definitely not trying to say that Remorse in general is bad. I'm saying remorse purely for remorse sake and thinking that just because we're sad we sin, that necessarily means that we've turned to God. It's not, it is not the sadness that turns us to God. It's the faith. It's the repentance. It's the hatred of our sin. It's the love of God. Those are all the things that really matter. Are you going to say something? Yeah. Um, I was just going to add something to what uh, you were talking about, loneliness. Um, you kind of hinted at it earlier. Um, the reason it's so important that we continue chasing Christ and being around, like doing stuff like this, the Bible says, 
mm -hmm. fellow uh, Christians, is the devil wants you to feel lonely. When you're lonely, you're vulnerable, and when you're when you're vulnerable, you you want to continue moving away. You're like, oh, well, I don't want my friends to know about this. Yep. So let me just hide it or yep. stay away from them. Exactly. And the further you get away from the church and from Christ, mm -hmm. the easier it is to to uh, continue in sin. Exactly. That's why, like I'm saying, it's so important to chase chase Christ with all your heart. The, uh, the way that Jim puts it is Satan's main goal is to get you alone and beat the heck out of you or beat the, beat the life out of you or something like that and there's that's that's obviously his main goal is to get you alone if you're surrounded by Christians what's the devil going to do right you've got these people to where if you fall they're there right there to pick you back up but if you're totally isolating yourself which let's be honest, if you're alone, it's, it's because you're isolating yourself. It's not. It's not because other people are running away from you. They're, we're all. We all live in Christian communities who love us. So if we are alone, it is because we're running away and isolating ourselves. And that is the exact position that Satan wants you to be in, alone. Not where a person. You know, you're not in contact with people. You're not physically there next to people. If you're physically next to people and you're confessing your sins and talking with them, that's exactly where you should be. Right. That's exactly where, if you if you are exactly where Satan doesn't want you to be, that's probably a good position to be in. Yeah. So. Well, that's where we have the warning: do not neglect the meeting of the body of Christ. Yep. It's not just about filling uh, a Sunday school. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That kind of reminds me of like uh, so many people. I feel like a lot of churches nowadays are concerned with their numbers and how many people they baptized and not how many people got saved right if you don't have true salvation it doesn't matter if you get dunked in the water if that dunkage doesn't mean anything if that if if what the baptism symbolizes didn't actually happen then it's totally pointless to be baptized you know? well especially since it's a simple and not some divine experience like people would have to exactly. same with the communion Exactly. That's why Jesus' revelation was so. In my opinion, like I know people who like are Christians, they loved it. They thought it was great. Mm -hmm. But me and probably him, I thought it was kind of disgusting. For one, they lied about the guy. You know, oh yeah. So so to, to to kind of interject here, because every time somebody brings it up, I have to interject this. So the movie painted Lonnie Frisbee in a very strong light. In reality, he was literally, he was married to a woman and, and was involved in homosexual affairs before he got AIDS and died. Died of AIDS. So not exactly a man I think we should be uh, revering. Uh, but, and, I but, and I don't think the movie's good in, in that way. In a lot of stuff they portray. <coughs> what gets me is with the churches that we like to write off everybody mm -hmm. from that period and say, oh, well, since all these leaders were messed up, yeah, I was saying nobody was saved. Well, that's, true. that's impossible. True. Yeah, yeah, true. But they were doing like the sinner's prayer in yeah. the show. Like yep. they would, they, would, they, would, they were like, oh, what if you're curious and you want to know, just go on down. So they go on down, pray the sinner's prayer with you, boost Dunk your saved. Water. And that that's kind of goes crazy. back to what I was talking yeah. about earlier with, yeah. with it is, particularly with altar calls, especially with baptism is... Baptism is definitely something you can point back to, to where if you are wondering of your assurance or not, you can point to your baptism. This is actually something that Presbyterians have told me. Hey, if you're not saved, we'll just point back to your baptism. Because, you know, First Peter like 3.21, baptism now saves, which is not what the verse says. But uh, good baptism well, saves. So if you're baptized, well, then just look at look it, to it that. Kind of, it kind of does worded that way if you're not paying attention yeah, exactly because yeah. we were talking about this yeah. oh oh yeah we're <laughs> well lutherans say they talk about the same thing <coughs> lutherans and presbyterians both say lutherans it. are a little bit better about it they're not quite as hard line yeah. as presbyterians yeah. about it but I, I will say though i think the sinner's prayer is probably one of the best uh ploys the devil's yeah. ever came up with like, if he had a patent on that, he would be making so much money. Now, what's funny is Lutherans get it totally correct in that 
I believe that if you are trying, if you are wondering, okay, how do I be sure of my salvation? You look to Jesus, which is exactly what the Lutheran says. Somebody like a Methodist would say, well, are you, how are you doing in your life? Are you, are you working for God? And that's not bad, but the the method, yeah. Yeah. And you're pointing, my problem with that is you're pointing to yourself. That's not what the Lutheran gets it right in. You should point to God. You should, you should be looking unto Christ. But then they go and say, yeah, and we find Christ in baptism and communion. It's like, no, you, you were almost there, but you got it wrong. My thing is, no matter what you say, and like Martin Luther is a good guy, transubstantiation is one of the most foolish things yeah. <laughs> to ever come out of the Catholic Church. Well, it was invented by Aquinas in 1100 AD. Well, everybody has their bad days. Yeah. <laughs> The thing about it is, think, think about this. Well, they, they don't really believe in the hypostatic union. Who? Catholics? <laughs> oh, Lutherans. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, they, they can't. Because they believe in transubstantiation. Oh, they, I didn't know that they still affirm transubstantiation. Oh, yeah. Okay, I, I thought they believed, in, I thought they believed in, do, yeah. in spiritual presence. Well... They would probably tell you that, but on the books, oh, <laughs> it's it's kind of, it's kind of like Mormons, right? Mormons are like, oh, we believe this, oh, really? We deep. believe in grace. We believe in but, Jesus. We believe in but Jesus. transubstantiation doesn't work because if the physical body of Christ mm. is in the bread and the physical blood of Christ mm. is in the wine mm. or the grape juice, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. It still comes from grapes, whether it's fermented or not. I can't stand when people fight over that. There, you are assuming a merging of the divine mm-hmm. and the human that is not possible. Because while he is divine, while he is human, he, he is, his person, his personage is distinct in the two. Mm-hmm. And that's what the hypostatic union is. If And so if the hypostatic union is true, which it most obviously yes. is. Yes, yes, correct then the physical body of Christ is a singular physical body that cannot be spread through the communion table throughout all of time. It doesn't work. And if Jesus' body is being, being spread, if Jesus' body is being spread, then the hypostatic union is true, and then Jesus doesn't have a physical body anymore because it ran out about 2,000 years ago. Yes. It's nonsense. Yeah, it's interesting looking at all the doctrines and dogmas that developed over time. What really, what really gets me is... I really wonder how many Catholic doctrines came out of... Here's a wild thought. What if I said this? <laughs> what were you going to say, Ian? I saw this video of uh, a, uh, a black bath bomb. A black bath bomb? Yeah. What does that got to do with what we're talking about? <laughs> what? This goes towards uh, Presbyterians who believe that you're saved. Oh, okay, okay. About to say, what? Says, uh, put that in your pocket when you get baptized. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no. Jamie, welcome back to that church. <laughs> oh no. Do they dunk a Presbyterian? No. It's, oh, okay. Well, that doesn't work. Or why yeah. no? That that one I don't I don't get that. One. They, they say the Bible talks about baptism as being sprinkled. We we have baptizo wrong. We've been reading it wrong. It literally every time I read the baptism of Jesus, I laugh when I see these Catholic pictures of Jesus of John having the water over Jesus. It literally says he came up out of the water. Well, the thing is, even how even do you come up the, out the of the water is, if they sprinkled it on you? <laughs> A, a Jewish man was about five feet tall. That water was probably four and a half feet. And so he's practically already under the water. By the yeah. Time. He, he, he dipping his head under it ain't going to make no difference. He's yeah. pretty much already fast. Yep. It does make sense. It's astounding. I had an interesting conversation. I had an interesting conversation with someone. He's bad for this, but he's like, now he's all obviously Presbyterian and Baptist mm-hmm. as far as, and Baptist as far as Baptism because he uses, he uses the, um, the illustration of uh, circumcision, maybe. No, no, no. Um, there is some somebody on the road just came to him. Or oh, no, no, it was it was after Jesus. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah. They were on the road, and it was like.
like John, I think, that uh, rode with the guy. Philip and the Ethiopian Philip. eunuch? Yeah, that's what it was. And yep. he said, well, let's get baptized right now. And so he said, so why do you, his, uh, his. That's a, that is a very great passage to defend what we believe is baptism. Well, so because what he says is, why do, you, why do uh, we have to wait? To baptize someone. Why should we wait to baptize someone? If they, oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Christian, right. baptize them. And I can, I can, I can sympathize with that argument. Like, why do we have to wait a couple weeks? I can understand that. But here's the, here's what you need to say. He certainly would have had water. I did. I did. Yeah, he understands. They waited I until they came to a, a pool and said, and he literally said, "What prevents me from being baptized?" Well, and it's, it's not even really about that. If you think about it, there wasn't anybody who would have been praised for seeking Christ and being baptized. Yeah, that, that's another time. great point. We have people who, who now the church is, oh, we're happy and we're hugging you after the baptism. And, oh, post it on social media and they've been saved and they've been baptized. They didn't have that at the time. And so him doing that, there, there is no... Nobody knew. Mm -hmm. there, there is nothing that is like prompting him to be like, I've got to be baptized. Like, this is yeah. the best thing ever. I mean, especially since he, he, he works in a pagan court, yeah. there is literally nothing that is compelling him outside of Christ yeah. to do this. Whereas again, today it's Facebook, friends, living up to standards, culture, right? There, yeah. there are so many things entrenched in us that it's, no, you don't let the five-year-old get baptized because you're telling them, they're gonna to go to hell if they don't get baptized. So, like, yeah, of course they want to get baptized. Makes sense for them. Yeah. Let me go. Yeah. Do, do you want to die? No. Do you want to get baptized? Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention it's water. You want to change your gender? Five-year-old child. That's why it makes it. Child baptism. Yeah. It's fine. I, I was I was saved at eight years old. I didn't get baptized until I was sixteen. I waited way too long. Mm -hmm. I know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But. Most eight-year-olds should not be baptized because most eight-year-olds, yes, mass majority anyway, are really just scared of hell, mm -hmm. which they should be. They should be. They, they should be. But not to the extent that they get baptized over here. Yeah. But you know, there's and there's there's different cases of people. I some the church I used to go to, we had a lady there who said she was a uh, she became a Christian at four years old. And she's, she's still walking with Christ her whole life. So mm. whether she actually became a Christian then or sometime later on the road, I don't know. But well, it also you can see the, the, the prophets of her faith. Mm. You know, so it's like, well, there's no doubt that she is a Christian now. It's just one yeah. it, it, it is a question. Like, like, one of my friends, like, I asked, like, at the time, like, what was your Mm -hmm. Well, uh, and and this is it. Also, it is important to define our terms because we keep using the words "be saved." We're a Christian. What we're referring to is a decision we've made to follow Christ. If you're talking to a Presbyterian, if they baptize their infant, that is a saved Christian at, at infantism because baptism saves you. And you're into the kind of like circumcision lays you into the well, Jewish they family. Believe, they, believe you, they believe that you can lose that. And then they believe you can lose your salvation while also somehow holding to reform theology, which makes no sense. Yeah. I think Reformed Baptist is more consistent with Calvinism than Presbyterian. Well, the Presbyterians also. But, have but we'll save that for the Reformed theology debate. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, oh, crap. What time is it? Anybody um, got any prayer requests? How would y'all rate the sermon on a scale from yeah, 1 to 10? A lesson. I think the question is how likely are we to crucify you? On a scale of 1 to 10. Did I put a target on my back? Yeah. Yeah. So scale of 1 to 3. You know, the Romans? Yeah. 3 out of 10? I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> you met her expectations. That's exactly what I needed to hear. How about that? Oh, I'm very happy to hear you say that, Jack. No, that's good, man. Thank you. It's my first one, so that's not true. When you go before God, God's going to be like, why'd you read the script, man? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, I went you, off a script a few times. I went off a script a few times. Guys. Good evening, hey, everyone, they, they ladies and gentlemen. They they teach teach that speech. We had to type our intro to the speech. It was ridiculous. Yeah, and they did not teach you how to... They did not teach you how to... 
But uh, does anybody have any prayer requests? So what? Uh, be praying for me with with school always. But uh, also be there's a there's a young lady in my class 